After the sermon, John Calvin came down the stairs from the pulpit, and he stood there beside the elements of the communion table. And at this time, the libertines, then those living in open sin, they rushed the table. And Calvin threw himself between them and onto the table and cried out in a loud voice, and he said this, These hands you may crush. These arms you may lop off. My life you may take. My blood is yours. You may shed it. But you shall never force me to give holy things to the profaned and dishonor the table of my God. After this, says Beza, he was Calvin's first biographer, he said this, The sacred ordinance was celebrated with a profound silence and under solemn awe in all present as if the deity himself had been visible among them. The Reformers, they had corrected the errors of the Catholic Mass and the Eucharist. They had shifted the spotlight of worship back to the preached word, back to the heralded gospel, away from then the focus on salvation supposedly given in some kind of cracker and cup. And yet you can see even then that with this example of John Calvin, this great reformer, they still had great importance. They still stressed the importance given to the Lord's table. Why? Why should that be? Namely because God's word itself stresses that importance, puts weight to this ordinance that we're observing this morning called the Lord's Table. This is integral for our worship. So these past weeks we've been studying about our corporate worship, and our worship is to be driven by God's Word. That is, in worship we are said to read the Bible, we preach the Bible, we pray the Bible, we sing the Bible, and finally we see the Bible or we see the Gospel that is in the ordinances. And so last week we looked at believers' baptism and how that displays the Gospel, and then this morning returning to the other ordinance, concluding this study, as we look at the Lord's Table. This other way that Jesus has commanded for us to focus our attention on the gospel in worship. Jesus commands his gathered church to observe his table, the Lord's Supper. And why? That we may never forget, that we might not forget, and so ever be a people formed by the gospel, sustained by the gospel, and conformed in our lives to the gospel. That, that's the big idea as we turn this morning. He commands us to observe this table, this ordinance, the Lord's table, so that we would, in his wisdom, he knows that we would then never forget, that we would never move on, that we would be a people formed by this gospel, that we'd be a people sustained by it daily, let alone weekly as we gather, and then conform to it, that it would show in our lives and the way we live. So as we look at 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11, just giving a survey to understand more about the Lord's table, five truths of this table that we'll see this morning about why it's for our gospel remembrance and our good to come to this table. The Lord's table is a table of fellowship. This is a table of fellowship with our Lord. This table is also a table for gathering. It's a table for unity of the church. And third, this is a table for, maybe most fundamentally, remembering the gospel. We'll see that here in the familiar text. It's also a table for examining, examining your own faith, your own soul before God. And then finally, it's a table for welcoming. It's a table for receiving one another as Christ has received us. And then we'll conclude by, like we did last week, kind of asking, not interactively, but I'll pose some questions that people commonly ask about, say, our practice and give you hopefully some biblical answers to those. So let's turn here with our time and look and see that this is a table, the Lord's table that we're coming to this morning is a table of fellowship. So the first reminder that this table gives us about the gospel is this, is that the Lord's table, it's a communion table. And that's why we even call this at times communion. At this table, there is a special fellowship that takes place between Christ and his people. So now, when you come to the Corinthian letters and you're going to study the Lord's table, I think so often we go right to chapter 11, and rightly so, of course. That's the clearest teaching on it in Paul's letters. And yet, if you pass over what Paul says in chapter 10, you miss something. You missed a powerful and significant piece as to what this table is all about. So look with me there. Turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
1 Corinthians 10. Now you might re remember, but let me remind you about this letter. 1 Corinthians is what we call a very occasional letter. That is, there were issues, particular occasions, you could say, taking on in the Corinthian church, and he's writing directly to address those, specifically. And as you drop now into chapter 10, we're nearing the end of Paul's extended discourse as he's talking about how we should think about food that's been sacrificed to idols, food that's been offered in worship to these fake gods. We don't have time now to trace his whole argument, but suffice it to say here, Christians should have nothing to do with idolatry. That's where he's getting. Look at verse 14. Paul strongly commands, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now these idols, he'll say earlier in chapter 8, they're not even gods at all. They're not real in that sense. And yet idolatry, participation in the false worship of these false gods, it's still dangerous. And here's why. In particular, in those worship services, in those idolatrous temples, there were sacrifices offered and involved. But what we see, they're not merely symbolic acts. They weren't really or simply symbols. There's something more. There's something real going on here. And to that, Paul then tells the Corinthians, and you should know this because what you know even about our Lord's table. Here's what he's getting at. It's not mere symbolism. There's something more here. There's a real spiritual fellowship. Look at verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Now what does that word participation mean here? Some of your translations might read a sharing in, or the traditional, of course, King James reads here, communion. I mentioned to you here the Greek word, because some of you will know it behind this here. It's the word koinonia. You've heard that before? It's usually rendered in English how? The word fellowship. Fellowship. There seems to be some kind of a fellowship going on between the believer and Christ in the Lord's table. Outside of this section here in 1 Corinthians, Koinonia appears one other time in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1, verse 9. Let me read it for you. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the koinonia, into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Called into this relationship. Fellowship is this relationship with Christ. We saw this in 1 John. It's a mutual knowing of one another, a sharing and enjoying, a passing back and forth between a relationship and communion. And as Paul continues, as you just glance now further down in the text, 1 Corinthians 10, this was true, this was true in Israel with their fellowship with the true God at the altar in their sacrifices. But this is true for the pagans as well in their idolatrous worship. Except their fellowship is not with the true God, was it? But their fellowship was with demons. Look at verse 20. They offer sacrifices to demons and not to God. And so what's the result of going to the idol's temple and, and offering those sacrifices? I don't want you to be participants with or in fellowship with demons, he says. These are not mere symbols. There's something else happening here of real relating or relationship go on. And it's the very pattern you see in the Old Testament worship. Consider how this kind of fellowship through worship was described in the Old Testament. When God established the Mosaic law, that law covenant with Israel, there were sacrifices made and there was this new covenant, this new relationship was established. And when that happened, the Lord invited Moses and the leaders of Israel to dinner, to fellowship at his table. Listen to this. Exodus 24, it's verses 9 through 11. Just listen. Then Moses and Aaron and the 70 elders of Israel went up, went up on the mountain, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven of clearness. You can think of Revelation as pictures of God. Verse 11, And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, and they ate and drank. They had dinner together. They communed 
They related personally and intimately with one another. They beheld God and they ate and drank. Both parties were present at this table together in close fellowship. This too is what's going on in some special sense as the church observes the Lord's table. It's a communion with the present Christ. Present in His church, in His temple, the gathering of the saints. Because where is Jesus? He's not in the elements, as the Catholic Church would teach. But where does Jesus gather? What is His temple today? Where is He? Well, Paul told us already in 1 Corinthians a couple times. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He says, Do you not know that you are, and by the way, it's all y'all, okay, together, you are God's temple, and God's Spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Where is Jesus? He's right here. And it's not because we're in a building, but because the assembled church is here. This is the truth that, Paul's, or that Jesus talks about in Matthew when he says two or more are gathered. It's not two random people, believers, just even getting together. But it's the assembly of the covenant people of God. In a special way, Jesus dwells among them. Particularly as we come to this table. As we gather, we sit at this table with Him in communion, dining at His table. Especially as we remember then the only means and basis for this close relationship, which is His blood spilled and broken for our sins. That's why we can come to this table. As we come into this table, into His presence and fellowship with Christ. This is a table of communion. It's a table of fellowship with God. It's also a table for gathering. It's a table of unity. While it's true that this table in one part is about us relating and communing with God, but that's not all that's going on here. This table also not only draws us to Christ, but it draws us into one another. Flip over now, look at chapter 11, turning to that key text on the Lord's table. It's really the clearest explanation of this ordinance in the whole Bible. We'll start there in verse 17. Again, as an occasional letter, Paul felt compelled to address this because their practice had become so skewed, so messed up, so corrupt. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 11. But in the following instructions, he says, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for better, but it's for worse. Now that phrase, come together, it becomes key in this text. It's one word in the original language, and you find it repeated several times. Later in chapter 14, that expression, come together, it serves as a technical term for when the church gathers. When the church gathers together in worship. And that's how it's used here. Look there, verse 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. So when the believers, they're, they're gathering together, they're coming together as one assembly of worship, they may be in one gathering, one location, but even though that's the case, they're divided. And that's a huge problem. It actually, what Paul gets at, it fully contradicts the very meaning of the Lord's table. Look at verse 20. When you come together, it's not the Lord's table that you eat. Now, to be clear, they thought they were eating the Lord's table. They thought they were gathering in worship. That was their intent. That's why they left their homes, to go meet with one another. But whatever their stated intentions were, and whatever formulas were recited at the gathering, whatever that was, here's what Paul's saying, it wasn't the Lord's Supper. Why not? Verse 21. For in eating, each one goes ahead with their own meal. His own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. That is, they weren't coming together to share in the Lord's table, but they were coming together to celebrate their own table. Whatever their stated intentions were, they stuffed their faces, and namely to the exclusion, or at the very least the neglect, of the brothers and sisters gathering with them. Some were hungry, while others got drunk. They came together, but you can see they were very divided. What had happened? The church had effectively, you could say, baptized the typical Corinthian dinner feasts. 
These dinner feasts that reinforced all of the differing social and economic standings within the church. Look at verse 22. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? You know, the typical Corinthian dinner feast, you would have the haves and you would have the have-nots in that earthly, worldly sense. You know, you have the wealthy on the inside with all of the best of food that they provided because they have it. And then you have the slaves and the poor workers on the outside with nothing. In other words, what is Paul observing? That their gathering, instead of unifying the church around the gospel, pictured in the Lord's table, their gathering rather further stratified the assembly into their typical classes, guilds that were assigned by the Corinthian world. In other words, their gathering seemed to declare the cross, it doesn't matter because everything's still the same. Their divisions, whether they were intentional or not, they tell a message that the cross, it didn't really change anything. Because we live just like we did before. Or in other words, your value, your standing, your significance are in what you have or what the world says about you. That was the message their meal, their table preached. But our gospel, represented by the Lord's table, preaches a much different message. It's a message about gathering the church in oneness, isn't it? Equally before God. Why? Because that's the message the cross preaches. It's the reality that the cross has made for all that trust in Him. You know, it's been said, right, that it's all level ground at the foot of the cross. At this cross, remembered at this table, it brings each one in on the same means, on the same footing, as a guilty, condemned sinner who's found mercy at Christ's feet, period. That is the message that saves and unifies and brings us together, preached at this table. It's a table for bringing us together. Because it's a table for remembering the gospel. Here's what it's about. Their divisions at their gathering, it preached this wrong message. A message that contradicts the very foundations of the gospel. And so Paul then, he goes back, he, he rewinds, he goes to the very foundations, the fundamentals. He goes back to the very significance of the Lord's table. And so to answer that question, what is the Lord's table all about? He goes to the beginning. He goes when Jesus instituted it. When Jesus took the symbols of the Passover, some key ones, and he gave them new symbolism. Gave them new meaning that points to an even greater deliverance. Namely, of course, he took the bread and the cup and he put into them that new symbolism that reminds us of his cross work, his death for our sin. Let's pick it up in verse 23, about right in the middle of the verse. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he praised God for the bread given at the table. And then Jesus took it in his hands and he broke it. He crushed it, breaking it apart. And he explains the significance of this. What does this mean? This is my body, which is for you. That once whole bread is now broken, ripped, separated, and torn. Of course, just as his body was beaten, bruised, and barraged with blows. And then it was torn with the lash and ripped and pegged and pierced on the cross. And emphatically, Jesus says, this is my body. What a contrast, right, to the selfish meals of the rich at their supposed church meal. The rich who were gorging themselves, probably on their own food, not sharing with others. And in contrast, he says, yes, this is my body. It is mine, but it's broken and crushed. And he says a reason. Why was it this way? It was broken for you. That's why. It may be mine, but I'm giving it over to you. Because you so desperately need it. Next, he moves to the cup. 
which represents Jesus' spilled blood. Look at verse 25. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. A new covenant. A new relationship with God. It must begin, it has to begin with blood. And the graces of the new covenant, they were no different. Blood was fundamental. Now, now, we don't have time this morning to go back to Jeremiah 31, where you hear of the prophecies of the New Covenant, and explain the, the many glories promised there. Namely, and chiefly this, that God's people, all of them, will really know God. They will really have a relationship with God, every one of God's people. But what is most new about this New Covenant is this, that that new relationship with God it's sure, and it's secure. Because, well, and here's where that little part of the prophecy ends. Here's why the relationship with God in the new covenant is now so sure. Jeremiah 31, verse 34. For, so he's going to give the reason. Here's why you can know this is true and sure. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That's what happened in the new covenant. When he said that to the disciples, these are the truths that should have been banging in their mind. All that separated sinners from God, from the holy God, those sins are never again to enter God's mind. Totally and completely gone. That's the new covenant. And it's here because he spilled his blood. It all took place. It was all secured by that cross where his blood poured out, where he died. And so as we celebrate this table, we eat this bread and we drink this cup. And here's what we're to then remember and think about and reckon with. Because that's what Jesus says. He says in both of those cases, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. These symbols were given as the bread and the cup. They are pointers to this fact. His blood and his broken body to remember him, what he did, how he gave himself for us. To remember and proclaim that his cross is our only hope. That's where he goes, verse 26. Summarizing the whole table, its meaning, he says this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's our only hope as we look for that day when the judge will come. Our hope is not our own righteousness. Our hope is in, it's not in our holiness or our morality. Our hope is not in our wealth, our influence, our status. And nor is our hope in some just general thought of God's benevolence, as if he's some great grandfather up there and of course he's going to forgive people. No, that's not our hope. Our hope is in this alone, that Jesus died for my sin and he lives. That's my hope. And that's a secure one. The faith that ends and rests on this cross, it finds a joy, it finds a security that's untouchable, that's unassailable, kept in heaven just as he is. He is our hope. This is what we remember. This is what the church proclaims as we come to this table. It's a table of remembrance, remembrance of our only hope, the gospel. It's also a table to examine, to examine ourselves. It's an examining table, examining of your faith. So if this is what the table means, what it points to, the significance of the cross, how then should that influence how we worship? How should that influence how we think about as we come to this table? And that's where Paul goes next. And what we immediately discover is that there are grave consequences for not taking this table seriously. Look at verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So Paul's first warning then, don't partake of the bread and cup unworthily or in an unworthy manner. 
Otherwise, he warns, you're going to be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. That is, you'll be just as guilty as if you killed God's precious son yourself. That's what happens when you take of this in an unworthy manner. You will be treated by God as if you had crucified his precious son. Okay, I don't want that. <laughs> So how can I be sure then not to partake in an unworthy manner? Well, let's see what he tells us. Verse 28. Let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So the preventative measure of taking in an unworthy manner is to examine yourself. Doing this first, test yourself. This is how you get prepared to come to this table. Okay. What kind of examination, right? As I, as I look at myself, as I examine myself, what should I be looking for? What should I be doing? Okay, let, let's see if it becomes more clear. Let's look at verse 29, because he explains for us. Uh, notice that first word in verse 29, for. He's going to tell us how we would examine ourselves, or the implications here. He says, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Okay, so this is key, isn't it? So crucial to Paul's argument here. We hear again about judgment and condemnation for getting this wrong. We don't want to do that. Uh, that it appears if eating and drinking judgment on oneself, right, that, that parallels uh, what's the consequences for drinking in an unworthy manner. So, so what is the central issue? Again, back to verse 29. What would it take to eat and drink judgment on yourself or to take it in an unworthy manner? Verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body. This seems central, doesn't it? Key. That's the one who eats judgment on himself. That's the one who partakes in an unworthy manner. It's the one who eats without discerning or recognizing the body. Now, I think those connections in the context here, they're clear enough, and yet I think we're still left with the question, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I don't want to get that wrong. What does it mean to not discern the body? Namely, this comes to this question, Paul, what body are you talking about? We're already dealing in a whole host of symbols. Well, what do you mean? Well, from the most immediate context, trying to identify what this body is, the last time he talked about the word body, it was back there in verse 27. And he was clearly talking about Jesus' literal body that was broken for us, as represented by the bread. And of course, the, that, re, that relied on another reference to body earlier in the chapter, from Jesus' own words. And he was talking about the broken bread represents his literally broken body. That seems to be, then, what Paul is speaking about when he says, not discerning the body in verse 29. That is, not recognizing or acting like that this bread is special. Not because it's changed in its material, but because it's set apart. It's set apart for the purpose of directing our attention to his broken body, his death for us. That's what it represents. If you fail to see what it represents, you're going to drink in an unworthy manner. That seems to be what Paul intends when he says examine yourself. He's saying test and examine your faith. Consider this question. As you're coming to this table, whether or not you are looking to Christ's death for saving. That's the question. Are you discerning what the body is there for his body? Do you recognize the significant thing that the body or this cup and the bread point to? That is, as you eat and drink, you must be mindful of Christ's death for us. You must be partaking in such a way, confessing your sins, acknowledging your failings, seeing your sheer unworthiness before God. And then you partake confessing afresh your faith in Christ alone for saving. Yes, you see the horribleness of your sinfulness, but then you partake seeing Christ by faith that he has taken all the punishment by dying for you. That's what it means to discern the body. And furthermore, on top of this then, if that is true as you come, then that means you not only come humbly, but you come repenting. That means you have to be willing to turn from sin. 
You must repent. You cannot harbor sin and honor the cross that this table points to. Now this cross, this table, it's not for perfect people. Not at all. This table is for sinners. But it's for believing sinners. In other words, repenting ones. This table is for sinners enthralled by God's gracious love who cannot but turn from their sin and follow after this one who loved them so. Because if you're not willing to turn, I don't think you've yet seen his love. That's why, as you even go through, as the church would go through processes of church discipline, it's always for public but fundamentally what? Unrepentant sin. For then their actions have contradicted their confession. Yes, they say one thing, but their life shows another. We don't have any confidence in their profession, their faith. So then they get removed from the church after this fourth step. And what do we say about them? They've been what? Excommunicated. Removed from the communion of faith as represented at this table. This table is for believers who are trusting in Christ's death alone. Those are the only ones who should partake. So to do so flippantly or thoughtlessly or in unrepentant sin is to do so unworthily, drinking God's judgment on yourself, which the effects for the Corinthians were grave, literally. Look at verse 30. That's why many of you are weak and ill, and some have even died. This table, because of what it represents and points to, is not something to be messed with. It's not a light thing. To take unworthily will lead to God's judgment, either in discipline to eventually reform you to repentance, or in some final judgment pictured here in dying. This table, as you come, is for testing your faith and then humbly coming again by faith and His cross. But without faith, do not come. But for all that come in faith in Christ, we welcome each other. That's where he buttons up his teaching here on the Lord's table. He brings this discussion to a close, looking at verses 33 and 34. This is a table for welcoming one another. So in summary then, when you come and celebrate this table, how should we worship? How should we come? The ESV reads here, you need to wait for one another. Verse 33, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Now this word wait for, it has another meaning, a more basic one, that I think fits the context here nicely. And more simply, Paul commands them simply to receive one another. Receive one another at this table. And think about Paul's initial rebuke here, about their appalling behavior. Remember, what, what, did, what did they do wrong? They, they were coming together at the table, but as they came together, they were actually fractured, splintered into their comfortable groups, creating the normal worldly divisions. And now if we've learned anything about what this table represents, Paul's saying, we must receive one another like we've been received in the gospel freely. Again, why do we need to receive one another? Because that's the way Christ received us, isn't it? That's how we've been received by Christ. And you might think, oh, but that is risky for me. That's expensive or costly to me. Whether it's having to literally feed the body, so they're thinking, or maybe it's the cost of being associated with those who might want to come to this table. Maybe they're of ill repute. They have a bad reputation. Or maybe they're just poorly esteemed. That can cost you when you get outside these walls. Oh, you're associated with so-and-so? But what does this cross represented at this table teach us? Did it not cost Christ to receive you at this table? This is my body, he says, which is given for you, spent and beaten and broken, and you were not worth any of it. You didn't earn that, and that's the point. It was a gift to you. 
What did it cost Christ to receive you at his table? His very life, his blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. He spilt it that you would be forgiven. You didn't earn this. It was a gift. If that's the gospel we are remembering and proclaiming, how can it be? as those so freely received by Christ at his table, that we would even dare come and not receive, not embrace those that the cross has bought. That's Paul's whole point. If you do not receive one another on equal standing, on an equal level in the church, especially at this table, then we have contradicted the whole meaning of this table. We have, practically speaking, denied the work of the gospel. Receive one another like Christ has received you. And if you're not willing to do that, Paul encourages you, it would be better just to stay home. Don't bother even coming to this table with your looking down and your despising of others and your rejection and your pride. There's no place for that at the cross, at this table, or in Christ's church. Be warned. Look at verse 34. If anyone's hungry, if to you this is about eating and exalting yourself, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. It'd be better to stay home. Receive one another like Christ has received you to this table at great cost, fully and completely and lovingly. That's what the table's about. It points to the gospel. But now I want to just address briefly here some practical matters for how we observe this and exalt this in our worship. That is, let me turn to some practical questions about our practice of the Lord's table here at Grace Bible. Hopefully we're taking scriptural principles and putting them into the particular practice of our church. Well, let's deal with this first question. How often do we celebrate the Lord's table and why? Now, we didn't have time to look at the example of the early church, say in the book of Acts, but they appear to have observed the Lord's table every week as they gathered together. It was central in their worship. And this seems to be the implication of what Paul gets at here in Corinthians, that they were observing this weekly. Because uh, a way to frame it would be this way. Could the Corinthian practice have ventured so far off the mark if they only did it like once a quarter? <laughs> I don't think they would have seen such a divergence from the truth that way. Nevertheless, at Grace Bible, we observe the Lord's table once a month, the first Sunday of every month, just like today. Now, why don't you observe it every week? Well, <laughs> we have, we do have the ex example of the early church, but we have no direct statement or scriptural command as to why to do it weekly. So there is some, as we see it as the elders, some permissible freedom here. Now, by observing it regularly, but not weekly, we're trying to strike this balance between maintaining that this is special, that this is significant and different. Furthermore, by not observing it weekly, we, we underscore that this table in no way saves us, in no way imparts saving grace to any kind to anyone. It's a worshipful memorial of what Jesus has done, not is doing, as we come and take this table. It's not some kind of re-sacrifice of Jesus, say like the Catholic Mass. And that distinction we try and establish by not having it weekly, but yet still regularly, monthly. But I do concede the early church did it every week, and it would not be sin in any way to do so. Next question, quickly. <laughs> Who can join us in communion? Who can join us at this table? At Grace Bible, we practice what's called open communion. If you've heard or you've been with us any time, you've heard me say about each month, I fence the table, which means I, I say who should come and who shouldn't. And I invite every week all believers in Jesus Christ to celebrate with us, but only believers. So if you were with us last week, despite our more narrow view of baptism, we recognize that one's baptism is not why or how one is accepted before Christ. So then, why one would be invited to this table? So what is required then? That one be a believer, trusting in Christ alone for his salvation. Or as in Paul, back to Paul's words, one discerns the body rightly, so partaking worthily 
And in view of Paul's strong commands to receive one another, to not divide the body, we are going to receive any credible believers in Christ to this table. But that leads to another question. Must I be baptized to partake first? Well, in view of what I just said, no, you don't. But you do need to be a believer. So let me turn to this sticky matter among us, looking particularly to you parents and to you young people. I need you to listen up here. This is particularly for you. I want you to remember, I want to burn into your minds the severity and weightiness of Christ's warning about partaking unworthily. To partake as an unbeliever in unrepentant sin is to drink God's judgment on yourself that in Paul's day resulted in the death of some. This is not something to be taken lightly or thoughtlessly. This is not a snack time at the end of service. Until a young person professes faith and confirms it with a credible witness, a changed life, it is wise to keep them from partaking lest they drink judgment on themselves. So though it's not essential to be baptized, we can see that it would be very wise to at least wait one's baptism until you join us at this table. Consider this carefully. And parents, you need to take this responsibility and discipline your children in this matter because they're under your care. Should we only take communion as the church? Here's the next question. Or can we do this in our small groups or say at a conference or a retreat? Maybe your fellowship group's going to try and observe the Lord's table as application here. Well, no, don't do that. <laughs> What did we see in Corinthians? This is a church ordinance given to the gathered church, right? Remember verse 18, Paul said, when you come together as the church. And verse 20 adds, even in the original language, that you are gathered in the same place. The point is, this is a uniting observance, not a divisive or fracturing one. The Lord's table should not be celebrated if you're quite sure that most of Grace Bible Church won't be able to join you and invited to partake. And especially since, as we saw in chapter 10, Christ's presence is especially gathered, or especially there with the gathered saints. If you don't have the gathered church, you properly speaking can't even have communion by yourself without the church. You might eat bread, you might have wine or juice, and you might say things, but that's not communion at the Lord's table if there isn't the gathered assembly. Fine, to this very perf finally, to this very pertinent question, very personal one. Should I ever abstain from taking? Maybe you're feeling that way now, as we've talked about the sobriety and severity of this. First of all, if you're not a believer, yes. If you're not a believer, yes, abstain. Never partake. But what if I am a believer and I'm struggling with sin or I sinned big this week? If I sinned and if I then partook, would that be in an unworthy manner? Let me give you some counsel for some others. Luther's right-hand man, Melanchthon, he made an excellent point. He said this, some will not venture to profess Christ until they can rather profess themselves. They wait for worthiness to come to the Lord's table, not considering that it is unworthiness which they are to profess, along with Christ's worthiness, their sins, along with his name for the remissions of sins. In other words, one other pastor wisely said this, if we have struggled this week and sinned, and we have, he notes, that is all the more reason we need the Lord's table. We need to be reminded in a tangible way that Christ made provision for that sin, even of that past week. The only precondition for a believer is that he is repentant, he says. So maybe you've sinned shamefully and deeply this week. Perhaps you felt overcome by this sin again and again, even this past week. Well, maybe just now, as you come to this table, let your repentance begin. Right now. He will forgive you. 
In Christ, He has. And He's saying, turn from that sin and turn to me and put the sin down. You don't have to live good enough. You don't have to be worthy enough to come to this table. So put down your sin and just come right now. Why wait? See your sin. See your unworthiness. But see Christ's fully sufficient worthiness for that sin in all of yours. All of them. Find fresh mercy as you turn to Him. And He receives you and loves you because He died for you, sinner though you are. That's the table we celebrate together. Let's do that now. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, I'm going to ask the men who are to distribute the elements to come forward. Let's pray together.